Welcome to this next video in this series focused on William Golding's Lord of the Flies. We'll be looking at chapter 5 next in this really central chapter of the novel where we have the symbolic beast being really firmly introduced, having had this hint of this otherworldly, perhaps dangerous presence on the island and it really comes to the forefront of our study now and really comes to the forefront of the narrative. As in the previous video, we're going to move to thinking about big questions that allow us to engage in the wider themes that Golding explores and, in, and considers, as well as thinking about some of the contextual issues that Golding is commenting on. But these big questions, these big issues of interrogation, really suit studying an allegory like Lord of the Flies. So our first question is, how are the boys in the setting connected? that's really starting to be drawn out more clearly and more fully. There are more considered responses and interactions between the boys and the setting, and we're gonna look at that. We're gonna think why is Golding painting that interaction more clearly and precisely, particularly in the opening of the chapter. We'll consider what is evil, what is the nature of evil, and what is evil as far as the boys are concerned. And we'll add that question of what is it that the boys fear? What perhaps is it that humanity should fear, as far as William Golding is concerned? And finally, as his voice is starting to be recognised and heard within the narrative of the novel, we will ask, why is Simon a significant character? He's so often a secondary character, he's so often a voice that is ignored by the boys on the island. Yet, like Piggy, the intellectual, scientific, rational, rational reasonable voice on the island, Simon is the character who perceives more clearly, and most clearly, in comparison to the other boys, and will bring him more clearly, more precisely, into our study of the text. As before, we'll look at a series of passages, we'll trace some of these questions across the novel, as well as bringing in our, into these questions some of the themes that need to be explored and discussed as part of our study. All the while, always focusing on what Golding seeks to represent, particularly because, as we've said in those earliest videos in this series, this novel also serves as an allegory. So the issues, ideas, are always represented by symbols, by the characters, by the settings, by the events in the novel. So we have this passage from chapter 5 of Lord of the Flies, Beast from Water, where the boys are debating the existence of the beast. Now, this is an, an increasingly important symbol as we move through the novel, and it connects the questions that we've been asking for this video together. Thinking about how the boys in the setting are connected, why Golding's doing that, why is, uh, what is evil as far as the boys are concerned, and there is a connection between evil and the nature of fear, and why is Simon a significant character. Um, that third question, perhaps less important here, but we'll look at that when we do the track and trace exercise. Um, so we'll start at the beginning of this passage and we have Jack this time because Jack's been given the conch but we see he's cradling it. So again we have verbs and the conch associated through tenderness and care. We know that it's fragile and we have that fragile sense of democracy. Still hanging on, despite the increasing distrust and fallout between the boys. But immediately, in the same sentence as that verb cradling, we have the choir in their dirty black caps. So we have this immediate opposition, where the symbol of dirt suggests the fall from innocence of the boys. Um, and as we move through this section, we have the leading older figures on the island trying to dismiss uh, the fear expressed by some of the little and some of the younger ones. Um, and we have this increasing sense of the boys becoming familiar with the island, this connection between the boys and the rest of the island. Uh, so I'll just highlight that here because Jack says he's been all over the island. So we have Jack as a hunter now experiencing the island. We have him gathering evidence to reject the existence of a monster. 
Now, we can trace this even just within this passage, because actually, if we go all the way down uh, to where the little one is talking about their dream, along here, we start seeing a very different version of the island being presented to us. So the imagined dream sees the little and imagine himself fighting with the island. So in the dream, the little one is imagining he is fighting with the island. So there is a disconnect between the humans and the natural world. There is a lack of harmony and there is conflict there. In the dream, we have this representation of a world in conflict. Well, there's a just a quick contextual reference I'd make there. We have in the middle of the 20th century an increasing awareness of psychology. I'll just make a note so we know we're talking about context down here. And a psychologist called Freud, who you might have heard of, um, explored dream theory and that dreams are symbolic representations of truths. Um, so this might be, and I put this one as a perhaps, a representation of mid 20th century interests in psychology. But we have us move from the dream where the, where the little one is fighting the island towards something big and horrid moving in the trees. Now this may just literally be just the wind moving the trees about. Just the trees moving in the wind. But we have this increasing sense of fear. The fear is generated by the unknown. That there is a sensation of evil lurking deep in the island. So if the boys are in conflict with the island, perhaps this is the island reflecting the boys. They are internally troubled. They are losing their innocence. And that the darkness in the boys is represented by the evil they fear is on the island. So there is perhaps this sensation that the island and the boys are becoming a mirror image of one another. And there is this very strong sensation coming through now that as the novel's progressing, as the boys are on the island for longer, they start to fall out, they start to divide, they start to, the, the conflict between them increases really, really quickly, really rapidly, really exponentially. And the island itself is more damaged, and more harmed as the boys uh, kill the sows, uh, set fire to the island, damage the island, consume its resources. Um, and all of that is reflecting the way in which there is this darkness inside all of us, the beast that lies inside of all of humanity. And Golding's allegory is exposing that darkness, both in the way that the boys perceive there to be this darkness and evil on the island, but also the way in which the boys move from civility to savagery. So we'll just go back up 
uh, further up the passage. So we're starting to question how the boys and the setting connected and why and what is evil and fear as far as the boys are concerned. Um, so those two questions we're starting to grapple with a little bit more closely now in this passage. And of course, even though he, is, he doesn't have a huge voice in this passage, Simon is the figure who sees this. Simon is the figure who is able to see the nature of evil, see the fact that there is some, there's a wrongness amongst the boys in the island. Um, that said, though, in the early stage of the passage, before we get the little one's testimony, there is this sort of staged relief when Jack declares that there's nothing there. There's no, there's no possible beast, there's no possible giant monster. Um, so there is this temporary relief. But that's reversed later by the disturbing nature of the little one's testimony. So a testimony is just when they say their story or their point of view. Um, and, you know, there is this continued focus on um, evidence. So, you know, Piggy, you know, is looking to support that. Piggy being this rational figure all the time, the scientific figure. Um, but the boys immediately go to taunting Piggy. Um, so they reply, what would a beast eat? Pig. We eat pig. Piggy. So there is the connection... And focus on Piggy as prey. And we do see that later in Piggy's death. And he is defined and described in exactly those terms when we, uh, when we have the description of him, be, of him falling off the cliff later on in the novel. And he's represented in exactly those terms. Um, so in that sense, perhaps, if Piggy is prey... To evil and eventually killed by the darkness and evil in humanity. All the boys are just as vulnerable. Now, at this point, um, we have Piggy holding the conch. Um, so if we just change colour to highlight that through, you know, we have P we have Piggy turning to Ralph for support, we have the conch being cradled, we have um, Piggy holding out his hand for the conch, handing back the conch, so we have the conch changing hands and the voices shifting. Increasingly, Piggy is teased because his voice is different. His is the working class voice. His is the working class voice. He's the boy who we can assume got his place at the school by scholarship, not by his family having lots of money to get him there in the first place. But his is the rational voice and voice of science. Um, and we have that here in this line. Life, says Piggy expansively, is scientific, and that's what it is. Um, so, And we've explored this quotation through our track and trace, exercises and activities. Um, Piggy rejects the emotional experience. And he focuses only... On the, uh, on the on what can be evidenced. And in that sense, each of these characters is incomplete. And flawed. No one character is able to negotiate their way around the island successfully. And Piggy reduces everything to scientific experience, 
evidence. He rejects the presence of the beast. But what Picky does notice, and this is the same as what Simon sees a little bit later and comments on, is we have, I do apologise, is we have here him commenting on fear. And this comes back to this question of um, what, what evil is there? Because we talk about being, he talks here about being frightened of people. So, Piggy identifies the true threat is from one another. That is accurate because, of course, it's not the island that causes the boys to come to harm. The boys do that themselves. So, he identifies that humans should be feared because of their potential for evil. And we'll just walk to red because this is a contextual point because of course this is perhaps Golding referencing the horrors of World War II and the realisation of just how evil humanity can be. And in that sense then, if we follow that through, it is nightmarish. It's entirely and wholly appropriate that that sense of evil is expressed through a nightmare, is expressed through the mental representation of that harm and that damage. So as we're starting to move through this, how the boys and setting connected and why, well, we can argue that the island and the boys are becoming mirror images of one another the longer the boys are on the island. The longer the boys are on the island, the more harmed and damaged the island has become. The longer the boys are on the island, the more they lose their innocence and the true evil and darkness inside of every single human and the potential for evil inside every human is revealed. And of course, as the novel runs through, the significance of Simon and his commentary at different points in the novel becomes ever more important and essential because he identifies successfully the nature of evil as we move through The Lord of the Flies. So having looked through the passage, we can now start to track and trace these big questions across the text. And this question of the nature of evil... So what is evil as far as the boys are concerned? One of our big questions. And this is the one we're going to look through now uh, and, and follow through. So we have this word fear and frightened. You know, these this language is repeated at this point. Because the locus, so that word for maths, the center, the locus of fear is under question. The beast that the boys are imagining is at the centre. But really, we are being shown that it, it is humans and people we should fear. And that impulsivity and that savagery that we've experienced again and again and again. So, Piggy, scientifically, rationalises that there is nothing to fear on the island. And in that sense, even he and Jack agree on that. Even he and Jack agree on that. Even And, and those are two figures who we very, very rarely see um, in a call together at all. Um, but then as we move through and we move to this quotation from Beast from Air, we have then this uh, quotation from Simon as, they, as he sees the beast and the monster for the first time, which is, of course the dead parachutist moving around in the breeze. Um, and, he, and it's his memory of it. And in that moment, Golding clarifies symbolically 
that man, sorry, that the beast is just a reflection of mankind. And that question of why is Simon important? Well, Simon perceives. He sees the threat and the true nature of humanity. And it should be no surprise that he is killed. Because he sees things, he sees the world differently. And by the same token, there's a parallel. It's Piggy, who sees the world differently to the other boys. And he, too, is killed. So the outsiders in this novel suffer. But let's look closely at this quotation in particular. So there rose before his inward sight. So in the first part of this video, we referred to this interest in psychology. We have this interest in psychology sustained. And perhaps this is a Golding's comment on the failure of the human condition. Um, and it's that sense of heroism, that which is to be celebrated and sick. So we have these two things in binary opposition straight away. We have the positive celebrated image but one that is deeply flawed and a problem because the flaws of humanity can never be fixed, can never be healed, can never be solved. And then if we take that idea further forward from an earlier in the novel, this idea that the boys and the island are increasingly mirror images of each other symbolically, we have the wreckage of the plane, the long scar smashed into the jungle was a bay, a bath of heat. So at that stage, I'll just go to a nice red colour color for the flames. Um, we have the boy's immediate damage. To the island. So that humanity's impact and presence is destructive from their first settling on the island and that is part of the flaw and the problem of humanity is that its impact tends to be destructive it tries to ameliorate which is just a posh word for make things better um, but actually it leads to destruction and it leads to death and it leads to misery and suffering and in the same way the boys themselves are in essence scarred, they become damaged by their experiences, they, as the true nature of humanity comes through. So with that exploration modelled through, you've got that scope to look at these three questions. So tracing through this question of how, uh, of what is the, what is evil as far as the boys concerned? What is the nature of evil as far as the boys are concerned? The second question, how are the boys in the setting connected and why? And touched on in this chapter and across the novel then why is Simon a significant character so you can then track trace and follow these through these three arrows here again always focusing as we've said a number of times on maintaining our uh, exploration always based in uh, representation what things stand for trying to focus on language features when we can as well touching on context the some of the context I've introduced you to um, but always tracking and tracing ideas from one point of the novel to another point of the novel. As you've seen here, I've started in chapter five, jumped forward and then jumped right back to the start of the novel. So we really should be using our whole knowledge of the text. So just finally pulling together some of our responses to these big questions. This first one, how the boys in the setting connected? Well, the superficial starting point of that is, of course, is that humanity and humanity's 
presence damages the natural world. It harms, it destroys, and it consumes. As we've seen, you know, the boys eat the fruit, they strip the trees of fruit, they kill the sow, which prevents any more pigs from being born. So ultimately exhausting nature. But perhaps there's a more interesting symbolic point to add to this. That the boys and the island are becoming mirror images of one another. That the island represents the darkness of humanity in equal measure. And then that naturally leads us into this next question to consider. What is evil as far as the boys are concerned? Well, evil and fear are set up in this reciprocal relationship. Evil feeds fear, fear feeds evil. We see this increasing mistrust and division between the boys. That Piggy, for example, says that it's the boys who should be feared. And therefore, in terms of representation, that it's humanity, Golding is saying, that should be feared. And we know contextually we we're experiencing the uh, post effects of World War Two, a recognition of the horrors of what humans can do to one another. Um, but that also evil and darkness are associated. We see that in the in the in the dirt that builds up on the hunters, for example, always being described somehow as dirty. They're just accumulating muck on them as they move through the novel. They're becoming slowly less innocent more associated with evil, evil acts, foolish acts, and the evil that humanity um, goes through. And then as we come on to this final question, well, Simon, and this is the reason I focused on Simon as this question, even though it's not in the passage I've given you, is that Simon identifies the evil in the boys and the island particularly when we consider this idea of the island and the boys being mirror images of one another. That Simon and Piggy are parallel characters. They are the outsiders. They often um, have the conch taken or stripped of them or stripped from them so they are often denied a voice and of course they are both characters who are killed without justification so Those are our three questions. We've considered those three questions. We've finished by bringing together some of these ideas. In your own work on this, I would expect you to add to these ideas. These should just be starting points. And certainly through the track and trace activity, adding your own ideas, issues and themes. And it may be that you even start introducing your own big questions to keep moving your study forward with. In the next video, we'll look at chapter six. We'll raise the next set of big questions. We'll keep using our knowledge that we did built up from our first reading of the novel and our earlier uh, close inspection of the novel in these videos. And we'll keep building up our responses and our range of interpretations to Golding's The Lord of the Flies.